So this is the interview with Sir Simon Saunders uh, beginning now. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask you a little bit uh, about Michael Green. I think you used to talk about Michael Green, and uh, then he, later on uh, he became an occasion professor at Cambridge and so on. And I wondered if you kept up with him at all uh, in, uh, in your later work. Let's see. Uh, well, not recently. <laughs> I must admit, it's been uh, it's been a good ten years or more since I've seen Michael. But uh, Michael had a, a big impact on me uh, back in the eighties. I knew him at the time when he was doing uh, his groundbreaking work with, with John Schwartz. Um, yeah. I remember I was interested at the time in uh, a kind of a high dimensional theory myself, um, which dated back to the twenties. So, I don't know, we were there various things we talked about at that time. I remember asking him questions about microcausality and string theory and ten dimensions that he found interesting and slightly um, unusual questions anyway. <laughs> uh, but no, we haven't really kept up uh, over the last ten years, no. Uh, but uh, then uh, you, you became, uh, started as a fellow at a, a Lydica College, I think you're right, uh, but then now you've gone to Merton College. Hey, could you just say something about the difference between the two? Oh, well, yes, so this is on returning to Oxford from yes. the US. Yes. Um, yes, originally I arrived in Oxford as a fellow of Lineker College, um, where Rom Harry, my predecessor, had been a uh, one of the founding fellows, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, subsequently I've moved to Merton College. Um, gosh, what are the differences? Well, the enormous difference, of course, is that Merton College has a very central um, and, in some ways, uh, all important teaching function. Uh, the Lineker College, as with most graduate colleges, uh, does not have, did not have. Um, and that leads, in turn, to many um, structures of the college, various kinds of committees, various kinds of ways in which we cooperate as fellows in the college, um, and a great deal of, well, if I can put it like this, service to the college um, that otherwise uh, in a graduate college is... Um, and have you, take, taken, have you taken over from, uh, uh, from John Lucas, essentially? Well, um, no, not taken over from John. John retired, uh, actually, when I arrived at Oxford. Oh, no. uh, so I'm not taking over from John. Um, it's rather that it fulfills a part of Merton's um, intended mission statement in a way that uh, as far as they take a subject seriously, and they take all their undergraduate subjects seriously, um, they should have two fellows in that subject. Um, so prior to my arrival at Merton, there was only the one, Ralph Bader himself, a new appointee. Uh, so it was partly a, a function of building up strength in philosophy at Merton College. Um, and that also, of course, marks a return to philosophy and physics, uh, oh, sorry, the physics and philosophy undergraduate degree at Merton College. It hadn't been taking people in that school for some time, um, uh, but now we are. Yes, well, uh, uh, the, and I was regarding where you, you, I first met you when you came to study with me at, uh, at uh, Chelsea College uh, on a, 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 a thesis entitled The Mathematical Philosophical Foundations of Quantum Field Theory. You remember mm -hmm. that in, enormous work you did there. Lots and, of <laughs> And uh, could you say, say something about uh, 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 what your memories of Heinz Post? Well, how do you find him? Uh, he's rather, in some ways, he was rather eccentric, but a very interesting man. Yes. Um, well, I think Heinz was absolutely inspirational to, I think, all of us there, but in a very specific capacity. He was inspirational his capacity as convener and chief interlocutor at the Thursday seminar. I say chief and interlocutor because he always had the first question or two and actually quite often interrupted the speakers, but he managed to create a weekly, um, uh, <laughs> a fascinating um, weekly seminar series that was, was both lengthy, two hours typically, hour for the talk and an hour of discussion, and extremely probing. And I think it taught all of us 
how to uh, question ideas um, being presented, uh, but carries over to how to question ideas in print as well. Um, often, without having a good understanding, <laughs> this is something um, perhaps it's a bit naughty for me to say, but that Heinz often lacked um, specialist expertise uh, in a given topic, but was nevertheless um, able always to pick up on some quite central aspects to the work being presented, um, and perhaps the some rather critical aspects that. Um, that speakers would wish were not being picked up on by the audience. I think it was tough to give a lecture um, at that seminar series, as I know from personal experience, because I did so myself. Um, this was another tradition which we've carried over in talks, but this Thursday seminar tradition, by the way, um, at Chelsea College, we have, Harvey and myself, Harvey Brown and myself, have tried to carry that tradition over uh, in Oxford and have ran a Thursday seminar now for some 15 years. Um, and it has a similar format to the Chelsea one, two hour, typically two hours, um, one hour for the talk, one hour of discussion. And I hope we're not quite as challenging as Heinz was because there were times, I think, where he really was rather tough with speakers. But we try to make it um, engaged and challenging. Um, so, yes, I was just saying, I myself gave one talk. It was a tradition in Chelsea that uh, finishing PhD students were given a talk. I uh, were to give a talk and I gave one myself, it was on field theory, of course. Um, and I remember it being quite a, uh, uh, it's quite uh, anxious um, that the thing would go well. I think it did in the end. Right. Well, uh, could, could we return a little bit now to some of your own work, uh, particularly, uh, first of all, um, you're interested in, in the Everett interpretation and so forth and uh, the multiverse idea of David Deutsch and so on. Uh, so well, could you explain uh, what, what's going on there and uh, what your view about the multiverse is? Yes. Um, well, I don't think it's right to attribute the concept to David Deutsch. Um, the concept uh, was certainly clear, I think, from Everett's um, so-called long thesis. Uh, not so clear from the short thesis that he published in '57. Um, at uh, John Wheeler's insistence, he had to cut down the thesis. Um, it was very explicit in DeWitt's uh, work on the subject, um, uh, and David carried on from there. The central change, I think, in uh, the Everett interpretation came from decoherence theory. Um, uh, excuse me. Um, So, excuse me, apologies, that was a bad phone for me going off. Um, it was decoherence theory, and this was really my own entry into the into this particular field through my work in uh, various issues to do with the failings of the von Neumann uniqueness theorem in uh, representation theorem for the canonical commutation relationships uh, that fails in the infinite dimensional case. I became quite interested in um, unitarily inequivalent representations and the way in which they can be associated with classical parameters. Um, so that work, in particular, I think the Coleman Hepp model, uh, really got me interested in um, exploiting resources within quantum theory for um, defining classical behavior. Uh, I suppose I did know a little bit of the work of Zurich and so forth, and the idea goes back to Dieter Zay, um, but as is so often with physics, I think one has to sort of discover something for oneself to to really get involved with it. Um, so I made my own tentative moves in decoherence theory, and I remember writing a long paper on this, um, mostly in terms of C-star algebras, um, which I remember giving to David Deutsch at one point, and him saying, <laughs> rather sweet him, said, I'm going to have to put my thinking cap on about this one. Um, well, I think actually that work didn't really make sense, uh, because it was within a one-world setting. And I remember again um, David Albert, uh, I think it must have been in 89, um, sitting down with me for an hour or two and really getting persuaded, partly from that conversation, that um, whatever decoherence was doing, um, it could not single out one component from the unitarily evolving quantum state. Uh, there could be no epsilon, however small, um, such that exceed that epsilon 
you get collapse, don't exceed it, you don't. Um, and that more or less led me to, pretty directly, to uh, a formulation of the Everett interpretation. It was a little bit different from De Witt's, um, more in keeping with Everett's own, insofar as I was thinking of um, parallels with issues in the philosophy of time or just the interpretation of tense and uh, temporal structures in four dimensional relativistic theories um, that um, really led to the parallel between time slices and worlds. Um, and just in the four dimensional framework of relativistic physics, um, one really has to consider the entire set of time slices for a given foliation uh, as constituting the universe, with, of course, arbitrariness in how one defines the foliation, uh, and that likewise, in quantum theory, one has to consider um, the a totality of worlds to give you back or to be an interpretation of the unitarily evolving quantum state, um, where, of course, one can again um, uh, decompose the quantum state into a variety of ways with respect to a variety of bases. The, the critical uh, issue for me became that um, the, the basis, the so-called decoherence basis, um, is one which allows one to view the components of the state um, and the, uh, the representation of the state at different times in terms of those components as dynamically decoupled from uh, and that's what um, I think really underpins and justifies the interpretation of the unitarily evolving quantum state as a multiplicity of worlds. It is this dynamical deco decoupling which comes from decoherence theory. Um, and what that gives, and this is a claim which I think is purely a mathematical claim, um, and one that I still think warrants uh, more work. Um, the claim is that the unitarily evolving quantum state does have a branching structure with respect to uh, the decoherence basis, roughly speaking, states which are well localized both in configuration space and momentum space, um, that it does have a, a branching structure and that furthermore, the, if one traces a branch through that branching structure, if you want a single branch and traces it, uh, taking unique branch at each place where branching takes place, um, what one has is a, a history um, which is well described by quasi-classical equations um, of the sort that you know, we know and love from open quantum systems theory. Um, so that for me was very compelling. Um, I s subsequently, roughly at the same time, this was Gordon Fleming putting me onto this, uh, discovered the work of um, Jim Hartle and uh, Murray Gelman, um, who were uh, doing this within the so-called quantum histories formalism, which is a very elegant and attractive way of formulating the Everett interpretation. They themselves, I think mainly because of the difference in view between Murray Gelman and Jim Hartle, um, were rather neutral as to whether this was a many worlds interpretation or not. But uh, some things I've also found with Zurich's work, um, and in um, Operating, collaborating with with uh, Wojciech, um on the Many Worlds volume, which I edited, co-edited, uh, is that uh, um, Wojciech too wishes to be neutral on the question of whether one has one world or many. But I think neutrality on this point is just um, a source of confusion, um, and um, there can be no question about it if the universe unitarily evolving quantum state does have this branching structure, then all of those branches are there. Um, we interpret the state in terms of multiplicity of quasi-classical worlds. Uh, one cannot interpret the state in terms of a single quasi-classical world. Well, another, another thing that uh, I noticed about is uh, that you've taken up the question about uh, 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 identity and uh, individuality and so forth and to come up with uh, some uh, new ideas, uh, what he called a Quinean view of the uh, identity of indiscernibles and so on. Uh, could, could you say something about that? Yes, um, well this this came about through, um, it was actually work on uh, 
little Kantian puzzle of incongruent counterparts um, that led me to the view that one really ought to take um, the a, a conventionally conceived world and its mirror image as describing one and the same reality that, only, that the intrinsic and invariant quantities alone are sufficient to account for all observable phenomena. Um, and invariant indeed under mirror inversion. Of course, that there's a question then about what happens with parity violation in the weak interaction. But it was in doing that work that I um, was led, I think, by a reviewer of one of my papers uh, that said, though, this seems a bit Quinean, uh, which meant, led me to look at Quine's writings on identity of indiscernible such as they are. This is in Word and Object, where he um, says something about identity of indiscernible. So far as I know, I think the only place where he actually uses that phrase. Um, and there he had the method um, first uh, suggested by uh, Hilbert and uh, um, Hilbert and uh, this is 34 um, but uh, so, so essentially exhaustion of predicates um, and that in turn seems to be the only mathematically viable formulation of the identity relation, um, really in accordance with Gödel's proof of completeness of the predicate calculus back in 1930. Um, it, had many, it has many great attributes. Quine had noticed this and um, proposed that we adopt, embrace this rather weak formulation of identity of indiscernibles. But he had it for um, what I've subsequently called strong indiscernibles and, and uh, relative, observ relative observables. Strong, strong discernibility and relative discernibility. Um, and what he neglected was uh, asymmetric reflexive relation, which also did the same job. Um, so I called that weak discernibility and started writing about that. Um, it, it seemed that weak discernibility copes with the usual philosophical counterexamples to principle of identity with discernibles, things like blacks, two spheres, and so forth. Um, it was Adrian Moore um, here at Oxford who pointed out to me a later paper of Quine's um, called Grades of Discriminability, I believe, I think it appeared in this, it was anthologized in this book, Theories and Things, in which Quine, as it were, corrected his omission in Word and Object, but he, he didn't um, actually say that this was an omission. Um, perhaps it's always difficult to admit to mistakes um, and things, but um, so um, Quine really had it all. Uh, uh, but he didn't apply it to anything. He didn't apply it to any of the usual philosophical debates, um, and he didn't apply it to any interesting questions in physics. But a lot of the um, contentious questions in physics about ontology, what kinds of entities are there, uh, things like space-time points, um, for example, there are many others, um, exactly can be treated using the notion of weak discernibility. Um, and uh, indeed, so can uh, elementary particles, or at least fermions. Um, that does seem to me to remain a problem with elementary bosons. Um, it's possible that um, those problems can be overcome. Uh, uh, Muller and Sievink have uh, a way of uh, weakly discerning um, elementary bosons that, that might actually work. I've yet to be convinced of it. Um, but it seems to me that here is a general tool um, that it, it, it connects to another set of ideas. Um, but it's a general tool for extracting an analysis of physical theories in terms of objects uh, in situations where the theory is not straightforwardly interpretable in terms of objects at all. I mean, physicists, of course, will typically interpret theories as they develop them, will have various ideas of what things they could be. But the theories themselves are typically expressed in terms of equations which just don't have the form of um, a formal framework anyway for dealing with objects. What is the formal framework for dealing with objects? Predicate calculus. So how does one go from the mathematical theory to something more like um, predicate calculus? Here's a way. Take the mathematical theory treating typically quantities. Um, from, from that extract um, predicates, um, which are typically ascribing values to invariant quantities constructed out of those quantities, um, and then seek a, uh, a domain of quantification um, whereby every element in the domain can by those predicates so constructed. So it's kind of a package deal. Um, and if 
you follow that route, then um, one's led to a, a fairly systematic way at arriving at ontology on the basis of physical theories that do not seem to be grounded in objects. Uh, the, the problem with all of this, I really can't be stressed too much, is of course you can always use language to talk about mathematical things, you can use language to talk about anything. Um, so um, many physicists will find it very strange, the idea that you need anything so systematic in arriving at talk of things, but I think that's because so many physicists, and I think it's entirely appropriate that they do this, um, don't particularly distinguish between mathematical objects and physical objects. So, so the world is populated by things, objects, which are fields, which are manifolds, which are gauge groups. Uh, so all of these things can take object position in a sentence, but very often what's being talked about is really a mathematical object. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a systematic attempt to distinguish mathematical objects from physical oh, objects. Yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, now uh, I think a question of uh, uh, structural realism, and uh, we, there was some, some debate about the ontic version of that. We, we had uh, Chow objecting to, to the work of uh, of uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, people in, with the ontic version. And uh, what, uh, what's your view about uh, the, that argument? Well, um, everything that I've just been saying actually bears rather significantly on that. Um, yeah. It seems to me that um, I was, well, let me start again. I was always attracted to the view which um, uh, I think actually Heinz Post also shared. Um, that um, there's much more continuity in mathematical physics than is usually credited. Um, so Loudon's famous um, computation of convergent realism seems to offer um, a counsel of, well, not despair exactly, but let's say pessimism, uh, as to whether uh, anything in our current theories is going to survive theory change. Um, so, and of course there is similarities in Kuhn's work and so forth. And uh, what I, one of my earlier papers was really an attempt to, to say this, that if you forget about most other fields of science, just focus on dynamical theories of physics, and I think there is a special status to dynamical theories of physics, it seems to me that it's when other domains of research connect with dynamical theories of physics that it usually brings about really dramatic progress. Um, I think one sees that in for example, it's used in biology and so forth. But anyway, so um, look at math, look at dynamical theories, look at the history of dynamical theories, and find a stability, really, um, or something closer to evolution of mathematical structures than abrupt abandonment of mathematical structures. So there's something about the mathematical formalisms of dynamical theories that shows remarkable continuity, um, and the continuity is one of a kind of a deepening. As, as we go on. So I, I was trying to make sense of this, um, and I think it, I, I, this was a paper in, in 93 that I hadn't read Worrell's um, uh, Best of Both Worlds paper, so had I, I would have very much said, oh, <laughs> John Worrell's, this is the right way to go. Um, but John Worrell subsequently didn't continue with that framework, namely a framework where one looks at the actual mathematics that's being used in physical theories. Instead, he went the way of um, so many philosophers of science have done this, um, try to cast it into logical terms, um, and in particular the Ramsey sentence. Um, and, and here I think there's, there's just a, a big mistake that's being made. Um, it seems to me that what the mistake is this, it's not that logic is of no use, I've just described how it can be used. I've been talking about pedicure calculus and talk of things. But I think where logic should not be used, formal logical reconstruction should not be used to actually reconstruct the mathematics of the theory in formal logical terms. That, that seems to me both a hopeless thing to try to do because one's not going to do it. <laughs> it's too complex. Um, and, and that it would be entirely unrewarding if, if it were done because what would one have? One would have you know, some elaborate really a structure and set theory, the elements of which may be mathematical, may be physical, um, 
it would be entirely unobvious as to what the elements of the sets are. Would be. So I think that's one thing that's wrong with that general program, and there are many others. Um, so structural realism, yes, it seems to me is the right way to go um, in terms of giving a, a really a, a picture of progress in physical science that is um, something much more, it's not accumulative exactly, but it's the deepening of ideas. Um, but that has to be cashed out in terms of the actual extant mathematics used. It's, it's no good trying to cash it out in terms of some logical reconstruction of mathematics used. And I think that's that's where this debate with Chan Sutsal really was connected to, because he was insisting on um, structural realism made out of the level of objects, um, and I was more interested in um, mathematical forms or structures that um, one found in different dynamic applications. It was, uh, now, one other thing was that we, we worked with Hilary Putnam at one time, and I was very much impressed with him, you know, and we had many arguments myself with him. But uh, how do you find uh, your work with Hilary Putnam? He was a very impressive person. Well, I, I, I never really worked with him. I mean, there was one project we were working on together, which was the interpretation of probability and the Everett interpretation. Um, he was skeptical that it could be done. I was um, insistent that the difficulties of interpreting, making sense of probability in the Everett interpretation are no worse than in any other application of probability to physics. Um, so we, we were, um, to, to, you know, we had a, a dialogue there that we were looking to write up and publish, but it, we didn't actually get far enough, or rather things got changed or derailed um, uh, or remarkably improved through um, Deutsch and subsequently David Wallace's work on the probabilistic interpretation of the average interpretation. But I would talk to Hilary about almost everything that I was doing, and um, with the bits that he was doing that I had any real um, grasp of, because Hilary, of course, works in so many different areas of philosophy. Um, and he was, um, well, he was inspirational to, not just to me, um, I think to everyone interested in philosophy of science. Well, could I ask you, for, finally, what, what philosophers have influenced you mostly in your own work? Sorry, pardon? What, what, which philosophers have influenced you mostly in your own work? Oh, I see, in my own work. Um, well, I think in physics proper you did, Michael. Um, I think you showed me how to really engage with some tough literature. Um, and tough conceptual mathematical questions. Um, I think I went astray, actually, you could have helped me more on this one, um, in that I got overly involved in, um, in mathematical rigor, which I think is probably a mistake in quantum field theory. Um, and I think what taught me that was, um, I suppose, I suppose it was just a matter of disenchantment over a long period of time. And I think also because then in the early 90s there was hardly anybody working in algebraic quantum field theory, which is what I'd been increasingly drawn to. But I think that um, my the biggest influence philosophically on me was Bert Drebin. Um, so Bert um, was um, a not a colleague, actually, um, because he just left the Harvard department when I arrived, but a, a friend, and he became a very close friend, someone I talked to about all of my papers, um, and who read most of my papers in the 90s, um, and continued to talk to right up until his death. Um, and Bert was absolutely inspirational. Um, he also, of course, was mostly talking about Van Quine. Um, I mean, there, there are other heroes for, 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 for Bert, but, but Van was the, the, the main most critical that I also was interested in. And, and Van's writings have remained for me. And, and discussions with, with, with Van too um, throughout the 90s, and again until Van's death, um, were, were really, they were great. Um, mostly it's his writing that was great. Well, 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 thank you very much for all the, 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 all the points you've made. 
And uh, now what I'm going to do in a moment, I'm going to switch off and uh, the, the, the interview with uh, Simon Saunders is coming to an end now. Well, thank you very much, Mark.